Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted to have you with us. As you probably know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the third quarter, that is the months of July, August, and September of 2013. This series is entitled Revival and Reformation, and this is Lesson 7 in that series entitled Unity, the Bond of Revival. That's an interesting title. Unity, the bond of revival. So we'll have to see what that's all about. Um, this is the lesson for August 17 of 2013. I hope you have your Bible handy because we'll be looking at a lot of Bible verses and some other reference materials as well. But before we start, I think we, we really need to ask the Lord to guide us. Will you bow your head with us? Our kind and loving Father, it is with a deep appreciation that we recognize all that you have done to make our salvation possible. How could we possibly belittle that in any way? And then we think about the challenges of church groups that have to deal with diversity and what an incredible, incredibly diverse group you have in, just in the Adventist church in 2013. People from all over the world with all kinds of cultures and all kinds of different languages and so forth. And how can they all be united? Isn't that really beyond the scope of possibility? Yet we're talking about unity. What, how does that work? Um, guide us as we study that subject and may we understand it better is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. What's the basis of Christian unity? The life of Jesus. The life of Jesus? How, how, how does that form the basis of unity? Because that is an example of how the heavenly government works. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one way we could picture that is if there's a, a light or something in the middle of a group and everybody's trying to move closer and closer to the light, what happens to the group? They get closer together. They get closer together. They become more united. As we draw closer to Jesus Christ, we are drawing closer to our fellow Christians. They also become more illuminated by the light. Yeah. Um, at some time, almost every one of us has either personally experienced sibling rivalry or observed it in someone else. It's a, we all sort of smile when someone talks about sibling rivalry. Think about our own past experiences. And sometimes it's a little shocking to ask your parents if you were ever involved in sibling rivalry. <laughs> I won't tell you about my experience. <laughs> but if a common enemy comes in to attack the family in any way, what happens all of a sudden to the sibling rivalry? Out the door. Out the door. Man, we're standing shoulder to shoulder and we're a family, right? So is there any kind of, is, is, could that have some meaning, that kind of response? Could that, have, could that happen in a Christian church? What, just coming together because of an outside? Um, yeah. Outside, Opposing force? Oppose. Is that, is that what's going to happen in heaven all the time? Because, um, but will, will we need it in heaven? Well, that's my question. Um, is that a good reason for everybody to come together? Well, let's, let's take an example. The example we've been looking at in the last week or two is the story of the disciples and the experience at Pentecost. Would you say they were all united before Jesus, is, before Jesus died? Hardly. They were at each other like you wouldn't believe. Would that be a typical example of, of sibling rivalry? Sure. Yeah. Sounds a lot like sibling rivalry, doesn't it? What happened when Jesus suddenly died and they were shocked to find him crucified and then all of a sudden he's resurrected again and he's gone back to heaven and, and then what happened? They laid their differences aside to concentrate on the objective. Exactly. Yeah. And what was the objective? To do what he had asked them to do. We got a gospel to carry to the whole world. That's right. I mean, we don't have time to sit around and fight with each other. This isn't time for that. 
And what did Jesus say in that famous prayer in John 17? Look at a couple of the short pieces. We don't have time to read the whole prayer. I wish we did. Look at John 17, starting with verse 9. I, this is Christ's prayer. I pray for them. And he's talking about his disciples. I do not pray for the world, but for those you gave me, for they belong to you. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and my glory is shown through them. And, and now I'm coming to you. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world, Holy Father. Keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one, just as you and I are one. Try to imagine Christ praying that prayer, just a matter of maybe an hour or two, after they have been fighting with each other, sort of in the upper room, sort of nudging his, and not saying anything too loud, because Jesus was there, right? I mean, here they, here's a sibling rivalry and the most incredible experience in the upper room. An hour or so later, Jesus is praying this prayer, that they may be one as, Father, you and I are one. Is that even possible for human beings? Well, it did happen. <laughs> Well, they're pulled together by their hearts being one, mm -hmm. as opposed to like a union that pulls people together by coercion. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus wants us to be pulled together with our hearts being one. And look what he says a few verses later, starting with verse 20. Now he says, I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. Who's that talking about? Yeah. Us. Don't we believe in Jesus Christ because of what they did and what they wrote? How many books did Jesus write himself? Zero. How many books do we depend upon for learning about him? 66. A bunch of them. And who wrote those? Apostles and prophets, right? I pray that they may all be one. Father, may they be in us just as you are in me and I'm in you. May they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. Our unity as a church is proof that God, that Jesus Christ came down to this earth as a human being. Was that unity, did it have anything to do with... Um, <clears throat> Agreement on questions? Common goals, yes. Well, I'm, I mean questions like um, theology. Yes. I mean, I mean, it's, how can you, like I've seen a lot of people in churches argue over things, you know, argue that where the money should be spent, argue about, you know, women or men, in church or whatever and it just you know that harmony just goes out the window yes. but then possibly I've seen people who completely don't dis that they completely disagree on something but yet they still respect each other and they still will allow each other to be themselves mm -hmm. type of thing so I think there's something else that puts people together besides just agreeing that sure. they completely understand, you know, that they, they just agree on everything type of thing. Oh, and, and I mean, the example of the disciples, that's what we're talking about here. <coughs> what, how well did they know Jesus by that time? Well, they knew him pretty well after. They knew him pretty well, and they had, all those words were recorded in their brains. They hadn't digested them yet, but they were there. And when they started digesting them and putting them together and realized the impact of what he really said, boy, it transformed them. They were ready for Pentecost. What do, what do we do about Paul and Mark? Yeah. There came a time when they weren't too unified. Yes. And so. And what do we learn about that? Well, they, Mark unified with, with uh, Barnabas, was it? Yeah. And they went their separate ways, and mm -hmm. Paul unified, I guess, with somebody else or himself, and they went their separate ways, and mm -hmm. so what happened to our unity there? Well, uh, there's some very interesting words from Paul that help us to understand that. It's found in 2 Timothy, 
Um, and I thought I was in Second Timothy, and I'm in First Timothy. Give me just a second here. And then we can always bring up Paul and Peter. They weren't yeah. too unified on a couple mm -hmm. of things for a while. Mm -hmm. And why not? What was, what was the problem there? I don't know. I forgot what you said was the problem that we didn't have unity. <laughs> well, I'm, I was looking for the... One uh, was with the Pharisees yeah. and one was with the Gentiles. Look, look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. <clears throat> and here Paul is writing his last few words that we have. I mean, he knows that he's about to have his head chopped off, that the judgment is coming, and he's writing a last few words to Timothy, and he says, verse 11, only Luke is with me, get Mark and bring him with you because he can help me in the work. Well, yeah, but that was long, that was after the separation for a while, when they weren't, they yeah. were, they weren't so, unified for a while, and then maybe, later on they got back may, together. Maybe even Paul needed to learn a few things. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> what did the Lord do with that separation? Yeah. He made two, two teams out of one team. Yeah. Well, I I really can't believe that they that Paul was really such an anger that he despised somebody. No. I think they they had to split because they had a disagreement, and um, and it just wouldn't work out until later. You know? Well, it gave a chance for uh, Mark to grow, too. He'd always be in the shadow of Paul. So th there's things to be gained. And Barnabas. Paul, Paul, yeah. He knew he was going into real troublous times. Yeah. And it was going to take somebody with real fervor and stick to to pull through this. Mm. Mark had demonstrated that he wasn't necessarily that kind of person. And so in defense of Paul, he he had no way of knowing that Mark had grown or was going to grow, and uh, yeah. But yeah. who was the other guy? Was it Barnabas? Barnabas took Mark, and right. they went to Cyprus. Paul took Silas, and they went to basically back toward Paul's hometown, and then on to. <coughs> but Barnabas was Turkey. convinced to take him. I mean, yeah. that, everything is fine. They were related. Of course, they were related. What, what, what's happened here is we've fallen into a discussion about the profits of dis, uh, the benefits yeah. of disunity. Yeah. Well, l l let's look at a couple, let's go back to the unity thing. Look at Acts 4, verse 32 and 33. The group of believers was one in mind and heart. None of them said that any of their belongings were their own, but they all shared with one another everything they had. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God poured rich blessings on them all. There was no one in the group was in need. Those who owned fields or houses would sell them and bring the money received from the sale and hand it over to the apostles and the money was distributed to each one according to his need. That's the kind of unity they had. Do you anticipate that kind of unity again? I knew that question was coming. Well, then you must have a good answer for <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Look at volume eight of the testimonies, pages 20 and 21. Um, and I'm going to read. To us today, as verily as to the first disciples, and by the way, and let me interrupt for a second, mm -hmm. if you would like to use any of these materials that we use in our, in our discussion here, they're available freely on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Welcome to everything that's there. How, how far ahead are these materials available, Ken? Oh, they're, they're, they're available several weeks before each Sabbath school class, so... So if somebody was looking for yeah. some helps yeah. as a Sabbath school teacher, whatever there was a picture. There's already hundreds of people doing that. Yeah. So to us today, you asked about us today, as verily as to the first disciples, the promise of the Spirit belongs. That promise belongs to you and me. God will today endow men and women with power from above as he endowed those who on the day of Pentecost heard the word of salvation. I mean, how can, how can the promise be clearer than that? At this very hour, his spirit and his grace are for all who need them and will take him at his word. Notice that it was after the disciples had come into perfect unity, when they were no longer striving for the highest place, that the spirit was poured out. They were of one accord. 
all differences had been put away, and the testimony borne to them after the Spirit had been given is the same. Good Mark the... That yeah. answers a different question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's coming. But my, my question was, do you think that we'll, the church again will have hold things in common like, like you were reading about? I don't know about holding things in common, but do I believe that the latter rain will be m more widespread and more powerful than the former rain? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think some of this is going to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. you know, some of what you read is discouraging. Mm -hmm. It was written over a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And where are we now? We're still here. Mm -hmm. We aren't in the kingdom. Even though we have this promise of, of the Spirit to be with us and to yeah. enable us to do great things. But what was the environment in which they came to unity? It was while they were scared to death that, the, that they were in trouble. They were huddled together with a common goal but scared that they were going to be in trouble. Uh -oh. And they were held together by a certain amount of fear of the outside, were well, they not? Let me finish reading what it says here. Mark the word, she says, the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Acts 4.32. The spirit of him who died that sinners might live animated the entire congregation of believers. The spirit of Jesus Christ animated every single one of them. Before or after Pentecost? This is after Pentecost. Yeah. Well, this is around about the Pentecostal experience. I'm thinking about that time before yeah. the Pentecost when they were huddled up there. Uh, is that part of they were, that's when they got together, was it not? Mm -hmm. During that time before, and, and their reasons for being in that upper room were to <gasps> yeah. stay, stay away from the outside. But they, they got over that. Well, 40, 40, 50 d days later, they recovered in the pe day of Pentecost. And boy, after that, they weren't, they weren't bowing down to, I mean, uh, stepping back from anybody. Do you think persecution and fear oh, is, sure. what, is what will drive that again? Well, you know, when we talk about this, we think, well, when it's going to be a great big thing, at the end of time, but there have been times since that time mm -hmm. when members or, or uh, of the faith, maybe not the whole church, but members of the faith have drawn together mm -hmm. in unity. Um, been times in the history of our own church. There are probably times in in in, in, in local congregations today, it may not be the all the time, but the promise is that 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 whenever this the, the environment is right, the unity is there. Mm -hmm. yeah, what's the environment? Yeah, go on, Ken. Let's find out what that is. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is the characteristic of a group that is enlightened, like it said, enlightened by the yeah. Holy Spirit? What is the characteristic of that group? Well, let's look at some of the challenges. I, I want to look at a couple more challenges okay. before we go to that. In the Roman Empire, let's not pretend that things were just peaches and cream for them. I mean, the Roman Empire was anything but a comfortable place to spread the gospel. Now, they did have the advantage that there was a standard language was more or less used around the world in that day. There were a few other things. There were some roads so that traveling wasn't quite as hazardous as it had been earlier. So there were a few things, but there was certainly no Bill of Rights uh, protecting persons' religious beliefs. I mean, you could be killed for your religious beliefs. So... And there wasn't an internet or... No, uh, no, no. travel? No, 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 nothing. No radios, no TVs, no nothing like that. Not even any postal service, unless you were the government. And no books? Well, there yeah, were a few books. Were slow and horses were slow. <laughs> but the entrance of Christianity transformed much of society in those days. How could Christians fight with each other when they realized that Jesus would have been willing to die for each one of them? And then I'd like to read these quotations. I wonder how much difference would make to our attitude toward others in our church if we really believed these words. I start with Steps to Christ, page 100, first paragraph. The relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care. Mm. 
and not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. So we, not, yeah. we have God's full attention? We have God's full attention. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 394. One soul is of such value that in comparison with it, worlds sink into insignificance. Review and Herald, April 1, 1880, paragraph 1. One soul saved in the kingdom of God is worth more than 10,000 worlds like this. One soul. And finally, I think this sort of sums it up, volume 8 again, page 72. Christ would have died for one soul in order that that one might live through eternal ages. Now, what does that have to do with harmony? Well, let's think about that for a moment. That's what I wanted you to think about. Mm -hmm. If you really believe those words, and, you, and, and, and you're fighting with your buddy across the aisle in church, and you stop and think, Christ came and lived and died for the salvation of that guy across the aisle, could you still keep fighting with him? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. I can see that God is treating me and you as very valuable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder if any kind of fighting is because you're trying to preserve that value in something, you know. Fighting and is usually a result of, I want, I, want to be, I want to be first. Well, that's a value. That's a value. If I, if I want this car and my brother wants it, you know, and we fight over the car, I mean, there's, there's you know, values that you fight over type of thing. Yeah. But if you know that um, God values you the mm -hmm. highest, and like she said there, that, that God concentrates on you the most, well then, why do I have to have my theology correct over somebody else's theology? Because God or, feels the same way about that person as he does about you. That's right, that's right. But that person's wrong. <laughs> well, what Their difference does it make? theology is corrupting it, the church, and with, with it, okay, the well, Lord and has that might be true. called me to do something about this. I see. It might be true, but how does God feel about him? And if I want to be God-like, how do I need to feel about him? That's how you feel about him. It says nothing about how you feel about what he says or what he does. Yeah. Well, two entirely different things. But if that person is causing havoc in the church, mm -hmm. something needs to be done. I, and we talked about that last week. Look what Paul did. He wrote that letter in 2 Corinthians okay. 10 to 13. But I, I love him, and I think he needs this correction. And he <laughs> loves me, and okay. he thinks I need correction. Yeah. So. Yeah, but why, if, you, if that were really <laughs> true, how can those arguments really do any damage? I well, mean, it think sure it about seems it. true sometimes. Uh, no, well, I'm wondering if that's true when that, that when the damage happens. I, I mean, I, I think yeah. self gets in the way when the damage yeah. happens. After the after the big ta da da or whatever the argument is, and they go home separately, is there really feelings of love for that guy, even though what he says? Or are there feelings of, I'm not sure I like that so-and-so, and I'll get even with him the next time we get together? Which would be two entirely different mindsets to come out of the same argument. And, and let, me, let me put it this way. If you really believe that every soul is that valuable, can you just ignore spreading the gospel and stop, take time to fight with your neighbor? Well, as long as you don't think your neighbor is stopping you from giving, from the only the only way the neighbor can the only way the devil can stop you from giving the gospel is to take your when you take your attention off of giving the gospel and focus on the devil, and you're in trouble when you do that. Yeah, it's it's so hard to keep self out of these arguments, yeah. and, and that is so so necessary. It's the self that we have to give up, mm -hmm. not the principle, but self has to be given up. Well, when the di disciples wanted Jesus to value them the most, aren't they, aren't they kind of doing that? Um, say that I want Jesus to value selfish, them. Yes. They weren't well, for their 
I want Jesus to value me the most so that I will get more benefit than everybody. Yeah, good. Satan's in control in that scenario. Peter and Paul both suggested that every Christian is to be a part of the great whole, even though there may be many differences. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 18, we don't have to read the whole thing, but you know the very familiar case where Paul compares the Christian church to a single body. And he says there are people who are eyes, there are people who are ears, there's people who are hands, there are people who are feet. There's people maybe who are internal organs, they're not even visible. But the church, the body needs every one of those people in the same way the church needs every one of those people. So hopefully if you really have the right kind of relationship with God, you can look at that brother and say, maybe he's a liver and I'm a kidney, but we both have a place here. He's a foot and I'm a hand, or he's an eye and I'm an ear. But we usually call him something else. <laughs> well, we're not going to go there right now. <laughs> but he's a something and he needs to be like me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> are there any anatomical parts that are called twits? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think I'll talk about that one either. <laughs> we'll and, have to go to Gray's Anatomy. <laughs> yeah. Well, First Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and Ephesians 2 talk about the, the church as a temple. And every one of us is supposed to be a brick in that temple. Well, I mean, I'm a brick somewhere here in the middle of, the, of this wall, and somebody else is a, over there in the footing over there. Can I despise that person? Or if we pull out his brick, guess what happens? The whole thing collapses, right? Well, there's a verse that I, I, I love, and I love to think about what it implies, but it's scary also. It's found in John 13, verses 34 and 35. Now I, and this is Jesus in the upper room, okay? Now I give you a new commandment, love one another. Now, he said that before, it shouldn't be too surprising. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now maybe that is a new commandment. As I have loved you, you're supposed to love one another. That, that, that's setting a pretty high standard. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. What does that imply? Well, I'd like to see two people who completely disagree with each other still respect each other. Mm -hmm. And not... I think that's important. I, that's... The, it's hard to find that situation. And I think that's, that's one situation that would is, describe that. Is Jesus saying that true loving relationship is so rare in our world that if you have one of those kind of relationships, you stick out like, like a bright light in a dark night. Mm -hmm. Also, if we don't love one another, we're giving a false witness. Mm -hmm. We're a false disciple. Yeah. That's scary. W why do you think the disciples decided to come together and live communally? They no longer worked. Have you thought about how they lived when they were following Jesus around? They were kind of a commune. They were like a traveling commune. I mean, didn't they share all their meals? Didn't they, you know, I'm not trying to well, imply they, any illicit relationship here, but they, they slept there together every night. I mean, men and women, I don't know how much separation there was. Maybe they found houses in every village they went, I don't know. But sometimes it sounded like there were a pretty good sized group of them. And if you walk from Nazareth to Jerusalem, I don't know if every night you're going to just find a nice comfortable place to sleep. <clears throat> they weren't able to find a, a nice comfortable place to sleep the night Jesus was born. No. No. Well, I, 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 think, that, I think that they learned that communal, communal way of living while they were traveling with Jesus. And the people who were outside who had only a partial experience like that, once Jesus was gone and the disciples were pulling together and they were experiencing this incredible blessing of the Holy Spirit, what are the other people on the outside, what did they want? They, want to they wanted to be a part of it. You know, it was like a magnet. See, you guys had the advantage of being with Jesus during his ministry. Share it with us. We want to be a part of it too. Let's crowd together, you know. I think it's important that 
that being with those group because they had been with Jesus. Jesus was still the center of that yeah. focus. Yeah. And and that is why they wanted to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that uh, look at 2 Peter 1:12. 2 Peter 1:12. And I'm going to pick one of the more traditional translations to read this just for fun. And I what is the traditional translation? I was going to look at the good uh, the um, the Amer New American Standard Bible, but my Bible didn't go there for some th reason. I don't know. Give me just a second. Well, how many Bibles do you have in that thing? In my computer here, I have about 60 or 80. I don't know. <laughs> Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. And that present with you means just not that it's here. He's talking about a present truth. What's a present truth? Well, it could be two things. Okay. I mean, Tell one, me. is, one is the, the truth that is of the time, mm -hmm. and one is the truth that is with us now. Yeah. Okay. One, has, one, one is physically with us. One is a time that is here. The Seventh-day Adventist Church used to have a journal called The Present Truth. What were we trying to imply by that? Well, in that case, the contents of the document or the publication was dealing with um, issues that we felt um, were of, of, of great importance for this particular time. Okay. Do those change over time? I they, do in our, they do in our minds, but truth is, I think, is, is there and it never changes. But the, in our minds it does. Because we learn, we learn, we, we, um, we get less ignorant. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're always ignorant. Now, we're going to be working towards God for eternity. Mm -hmm. But um, present truth, I, I, I'm trying to figure out where you're getting at here. Okay. Yes. Present truth in the days of Noah was get in the ark. Yes. It's not that today. Okay. So it does change. Okay. I, I yeah. once wanted to name something present truth. Uh, journal or something, and uh, I was told, well, truth is truth. It's always truth. Uh -huh. So it doesn't matter whether it's present, past, or future. It's always truth if it's true. Mm. Well, but it turns out... It there turn is relevance. Yes. It turns out that there are some truths which are more important right now than they were at other times in the past, and there were truths that were very important in the past which may not be quite so important right now. <coughs> is there a present truth that's supposed to be important among Seventh-day Adventists in the 21st century? This is the time of the end, the time of the judgment. We live in the time of the end, and what are we supposed to be telling the world about? Three angels' message. Well, it's interesting that we have been, it has been suggested that we are supposed to be the people presenting the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. How many Seventh-day Adventists know how to present that in a way that's loving and kind and attractive? Well, there's another question, too. Mm -hmm. uh, do we really Only one know other question? What, mm -hmm. there, <laughs> do we really know what that truth is? What percentage of the world's population have even heard of the Three Angels' message? Very few. Very few of them. Well. There are times when issues arise, and some of you have already talked about this, affecting larger groups in the church. It's not just Jay and I that have to settle our differences. We got an issue that affects the whole lot of us. Can you think of an example in the early church? That whole thing about how much of the former Jewish mm -hmm. laws they had to comply with in the, do in the you new Christian be, church. Do you need to be circumcised to right. be a Christian? Do you need to follow all the Jewish, Jewish rules? Well, they came together, because this was a huge issue, they came together, and it's discussed what happened in Acts 15. Um, we don't have time to look at the whole chapter, but they came together, and they had the first, what we might call, general conference. And when they got done, down at the end, starting with about verse 23, 
We, the apostles and the elders, your brothers, send greetings to all our brothers of Gentile birth who live in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. We have heard that some of you went from our group, from some who went from our group, have troubled and upset you by what they said. They had not, however, received any instruction from us. And so we have met together and have all agreed to choose some messengers and send them to you. They will go with our dear friends, notice that interesting mm -hmm. title, our dear friends, Paul, Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives in the service of our Lord Jesus Christ. We send you then Judas and Silas, and Silas is the one who later was a partner of Paul's, mm -hmm. who will tell you in person the same things we are writing. The Holy Spirit and we, were they convinced that they had chosen the truth, the present truth? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to idols. Eat no blood. Eat no animal that has been strangled. And keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. Does that mean that the gospel is all about negatives? No. That had to do with the issues of their time. Okay. And the, gospel, the, the gospel was entirely different than, than what that was but talking you know, about. The gospel, though, is it, it's, it's the same when you look at it, you know, in its purest form, which we, we can't. I mean, we're all trying to find it. But um, the way we get to it, is is going to change as time goes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just I'm thinking about present truth. I mean, when Henry Ford made his Model T, he was using present truth of automobile technology back then. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at a brand new 2013 Ford, there is technology in there that goes way beyond what he did. But the truth hasn't changed. Yeah, you know. The um, just the understanding and the depth of the truth has come out, yep. and that, that can happen even in theology, in, even in religious um, ideas. Well, let's look at that example. They were told basically these rules that they were were given in Acts 15 was the, was for the fact that there were now Jews trying to worship together with Christians, with Gentile, Gentile Christians. Jewish Christians trying to worship together with Gentile Christians. And these are the rules that the Jews felt were necessary for them to be willing to sit down next door or beside a Gentile. If you do those things, if you avoid doing those evil things, then at least we can sit beside each other in church. Okay? You know, I was in a, a Sunday church and I thought it was absolutely wonderful. The pastor spent the entire hour we had this handout on how to present the gospel to whoever you want to talk to. Mm -hmm. And they had it streamlined, and they had just the uh, basics, and they had the little diagram, and they had a piece of paper um, where you drew the cross over two cliffs yeah. and stuff like that. Um, we seem so confused. I've never heard a sermon that sits the whole congregation down and says, now this is Three Angels' message. And this is what you can say, this is what you can hand out, this is what you can do to uh, talk to someone that doesn't know the gospel or doesn't know the great controversy theme. Um, why have we not yeah. uh, made it usable? We have not made it usable. It's this gigantic thing, we don't even know where to start. It's like eating an elephant. Mm -hmm. And you go, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it might be because Jesus isn't here to make that streamlined sheet. I mean, we're just our human... But I mean, uh, it seems like the church can get together and, and make something for people to handle. Yeah, it seems like Well, yeah. let's look at the early gospel. But that was unity. I the mean, early, the congregation was unified. Yeah. Let's look at the early Christian experience. Okay. Paul went forth from that meeting. He took Silas with him. And a year or two later, he's back in Corinth. And what does he say? <laughs> eh, not to worry too much about those ideas. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't quite like that. He said, he said, you know, that food which has been offered to idols hasn't really been changed. And I think um, 
we need to think about what the implications of that. And he, discard, he, he has a great long discussion. Part of it's in Romans 14, and the other part is in 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. And look at uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 25. He comes to his final conclusion. Now think about the fact that he's just come from the general conference and they have said one of the things that's not allowed is eating what? Food that has been offered to idols. And Paul says, after a lot of explanation, which we've skipped over, so you need to go back and look at the explanation. What, what verse are you? Verse 25. 1 Corinthians 10, 25. You are free to eat anything sold in the meat market without asking any questions because of your conscience. For as the scripture says, the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. But then he stops and he says, if an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you decide to go, eat what is set before you without asking any questions because of your conscience. Now notice that this is not talking about whether it has cholesterol in it or anything with too much sugar or whatever like this. This is talking about ceremonial things. It's talking about what's right to eat or whether you're misrepresenting God. But then, verse 28, but if someone says to you, this food was offered to idols, then do what? Do not eat that food for the sake of the one who told you and for conscience sake. That is, not your own conscience, your own conscience. You know that that food has not been affected by being offered to that idol, but for the other person's conscience. Well then, someone asks, why should my freedom to act be limited by another person's conscience? If I thank God for my food, why should anyone criticize me about food for which I give thanks? Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, or do it all, do it all for the God's glory. Now, let's, let's think about what Paul has just said. We're talking about unity now, okay? At that general conference, they said, well, if we, if we all agree on these things, then we'll be able to sit together in church. And Paul says, if we understand the truth about how idols affect food, we'll be even able to sit even closer to our friends in church. Because whether they eat the food or whether they don't, you know, I don't have to go, Jay, what did you have to eat today? Veggie burger. <laughs> see, you don't have to do that, see? If you now realize that the, the food offered idols, the idols didn't affect it in any way, you don't even have to ask about that question. So Paul is saying, you can, be, you can have even greater unity if you follow my guidance than those people back in Jerusalem had. So what would, would you call that present truth in Paul's day? Or rebellious truth. Situation. <laughs> be careful, be careful. <laughs> well, of course, there are some things about which we, can't, we can never compromise. And what would that be? Look at Galatians 1, 8 and 9. And I really should stop, start with verse, sec, verse 6. Paul is writing to a group of Christians who lived up the northern part of modern-day Turkey in an area called Galatia. And some Judaizers had come, some groups that want, still were trying to fight for the idea that you had to be completely a Jew before you could be a Christian. And he had gotten uh, these people, one or more, I don't know how many of them there were, had convinced the Galatians to start moving away from the, from the freedom of the truth that Paul had taught them. And Paul says these, start, verse, starting in verse 6, I am surprised at you. In no time at all you are deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are accepting another gospel. Actually, there is no other gospel. But I say this because there are some people who are upsetting you and trying to change the gospel of Christ. Those people, I think, they have present truth. Well, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different from the one we preach to you, may he be condemned to hell. We have said it before and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Did, Did does Paul ever tell you how he really thinks? <laughs> <laughs> Scratch unity. <laughs> so Paul was saying, follow Christ and what he said, and don't follow the old Jewish customs? 
He's saying if someone comes in and tries to tear the church apart, what do you do? You sit there and let him do it? I, I, I don't want to argue with you, brother. Just go ahead, do your thing, right? No, you have to no. preserve the gospel. Go to hell. <laughs> <I'll help. laughs> yeah, that's what he said. If, if they are destroying the gospel as Jesus yeah. taught it? Exactly. Well, they weren't really getting torn apart there. They were just being led the wrong way. Well, but were, some of them were not being led, and others being led, and they're being torn apart. They're, Hopefully there was somebody <laughs> standing up for yeah. something, and that would, that would be... Yeah, but it, it seems like they were, yeah, but it says they were listening to somebody else and not yeah. what Paul had said. And even Paul said that even if I came in with a different message, yeah. don't do that. So it's not that... There was, so, the, the message was coming from somewhere else besides people, even him. Where would, where, where would we find out what's the real truth so we know what we can stand with? The Bible. The Bible. And at, at the time that uh, Paul was talking about it, it would be the Old Testament. Yeah. Well, at least base your ideas on the Bible. Some very interesting research has been done in relatively recent times about people who join churches and then leave, and people who join churches and stay. And what's the difference between the people who sort of walk in and then pretty soon walk out again, and those people who stay? Well, there are three things that distinguish the people who stay. And these are really important. In fact, you have to have two of these things, two of the three, otherwise you're not going to stick around. One, you should believe in the core teachings of the church that you have joined. You really believe that this is the right place to be. Two, you need to become involved in church activities. If you feel like you're a part of the organization, you've got something to do there and you're, you're part of it, that makes a big difference. And three, you develop a close relationship with certain members in that church body. If you feel like you're a good friend of people and you maybe go over to their house on Sabbath dinner, you have lunch together, they come to your house and so forth, it's much less likely that you're going to leave. So if you've got two, any two of those three, at least, and ideally, of course, you have all three, then you're going to stick with that church. Now, what does that tell us about unity? It's doctrinal and it's personal uh, friendship. And it's involvement. Involvement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So when we bring people into the church, we work on bringing them into the church, what do we need to be focusing on? Well, look at the disciples when they were full of the Holy Spirit. They had um, a mission. They had each other that they were friends with, and mm -hmm. um, they believed in the doctrine or yeah. in Jesus. It yeah. sounds like, though, we, we have to be careful that to preserve unity first. I mean, look out for it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Um, and then anything that, that comes to kind of shake that, um, let's be careful of it. Let's, let's um, deal with it somehow without breaking well, the... Ellen White put it in these words. She said, we need to be so settled into the truth that we cannot be moved. We need to know the truth from Scripture backwards and forwards. And these are her words again. What was the result of the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost? The glad tidings of a risen Savior were carried to the uttermost parts of the inhabited world. As the disciples proclaimed the message of redeeming grace, hearts yielded to the power of this message. The church beheld converts flocking to her from all directions. Backsliders were reconverted. Sinners united with believers and seeking the pearl of great price. Some who had been the bitterest opponents I wonder who that could be talking about. Of the gospel became its champions. The prophecy was fulfilled. He that is feeble shall be as David in the house of David as the angel of the Lord. Zechariah 12, 8. Every Christian saw in his brother a revelation of divine love and benevolence. When did that happen? Well, it, it, around about and soon after Pentecost. Oh. One interest prevailed. One subject of emulation. Emulation means everybody wants to copy it swallowed up all others. The ambition of believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom, Acts of the Apostles 48, paragraph 1. 
So how do we reveal a likeness in Christ, to Christ's character? We better have our eyes fixed on becoming like by what Jesus did, what he was like, how we can become like him. That, that needs to be our goal. There's another beautiful paragraph in The Faith I Live By on page 150. If we keep our minds stayed upon Christ, he will come unto us as the rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth, as the son of righteousness. He will rise upon us with healings in his wings. We shall grow as the lily. We shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine by constantly relying upon Christ as our personal Savior, we shall grow up into him in all things, who is our head. Is there enough symbology mm -hmm. in there, enough? Uh, yeah. uh, you, you can't take them literally, but it gives a message yeah. of how, how permanent and how permeating it is. Yeah. Well, the early Christian churches, Christians, I mean the early Christians prayed together, talked together, studied God's Word together, and went out to share their faith with anyone who would listen, yeah. even priests and Pharisees. Let's look at those, those verses. Sometimes we forget this. Look at Acts 6, verse 7. And so the Word of God continued to spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. Where did that group come from? Did we have a name for them in Jesus' day? enemies. And they probably belong to the Sadducees. Then we turn to Acts 15 verse 5. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said da 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 da. Okay. So now we have Sadducees and Pharisees <coughs> becoming Christians. Is well, our church growing in North America? Yes, but not very fast. Okay, so it is growing. Okay. And these first disciples, these are words, Ellen White's words again, was presented marked diversity. They were to be the world's teachers, and they represented widely varied types of character in order to successfully to in order successfully to carry forward the work of which they were had been the work to which they had been called. These men, differing in natural characteristics and in habits of life, needed to come into unity of feeling, thought, and action. This unity, it was Christ's object to secure. To this end, he sought to bring them into unity with himself. Remember, if you have the light out there and people are coming toward the light, what's happening? Mm -hmm. They're getting closer together. Christ sought to bring them into unity with himself. The burden of his labor for them was expressed in his prayer to his Father, and we've read these verses already, that they may all, that they may, they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. John 17, 21, anyway, 23. His constant prayer for them was that they might be sanctified through the truth. And he prayed with assurance knowing that an almighty decree had been given before the world was made. He knew that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached to all nations for a witness. He knew that the truth armed with the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit would conquer the battle with evil and that the blood-stained banner would one day wave triumphantly over his followers. Acts the Apostles, page 20, paragraph 2. What a... Yeah, that's powerful. Yeah. What do you think it means that an almighty decree had been given before the world was made? Well, the, the New Testament talks about names being written in God's book before the world was made. I think he's saying, I already know who my people are, and let me at them. Let, let me work with them. Calvin would like that, wouldn't he? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Well, when dealing with a worldwide church where social and cultural beliefs vary so greatly, how do we maintain unity? How many, how much freedoms, how much freedom should subunits of the church have, such as divisions, unions, and conferences, even local congregations have, to differ from the body without causing a complete split? Now we know that there are things happening all the time that are bringing about differences. The role of women in ministry, for example. 
We almost had a split. Should that be allowed? Do someone's cultural beliefs in Africa need to be limitations to me? It has split congregations. I know um, a church that split on um, women as deacons. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they became two different little denominations. But you know, then they can rest in peace in their denomination. I sort of think that might be better than constantly bickering. Well, there will be a shaking. Is it really possible for us as human beings to be as close to each other as the Father is to the Son. That's what Jesus was praying for. Only in Christ. Would it help if we did the Paul thing, Romans 14, welcome those who are weak in faith, but do not argue with them about their personal opinions. Some people's faith allows them to eat anything. This is back to the food offered to idols thing. While but the person who is weak in the faith eats only vegetables. Oh dear. Those who will eat anything are not to despise those who don't, while those who eat only vegetables are not to pass judgment on those who will eat anything, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servants? It is their own master who will decide whether they succeed or fail. And they will succeed because the Lord is able to make them succeed. Uh, does that sound like God has set some human beings up to be judges? No, some human beings set themselves up to be judges. Paul's illustration about the human body clearly suggests that different parts have different functions. How much variation does that suggest might exist between different church subunits as we seek to finish the gospel? How many of the differences that arise in the church arise because some individual, a small group of individuals, are just being stubborn? If we truly focused 100% on the mission of finishing the gospel, how many of these small differences would just not matter or even disappear? Church unity is a great goal and we need to keep it in mind. But I think the only way we're going to succeed to that is for each one to keep his eyes focused on Jesus. I can't be looking at you and say, why are you doing that? Yeah. You, why are you doing that? We just don't have time to do that kind of stuff. We, if we are focusing all on Jesus, the day will come when by coming closer to him, we'll come in unity with each other. And that's our goal. I'm sure of it. See you next week.